Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. Pine 64 has done it again and done it better than ever with the Pinebook Pro US keyboard ANSI edition. We're going to be getting into the box. We're going to be actually taking it apart and looking inside. And we're going to be learning all about this beautiful $200 Linux Pro book in just a couple of moments time. Stick around. Recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's so nice to have you here. Last week was a bit of a write-off because we had some technical difficulties, but this week we are on the air. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the air. Am I right? Chat room? Can you see us? Can you hear us? Are the lights good? Uh... Is the sound good? Are we here? Yes, I believe we are. I believe we are. I think we are. At least I'm Fantastic. here. I'm here. <laughs> we are not just a figment of your We're not going to get 20 minutes in and then realize that we're not actually recording yes. and broadcasting. Yes, if you yeah, can't hear okay. us right now, let us know. Yes. It was the <laughs> best 20 minutes of any show ever. <laughs> you know what? It was a really great start. It I, was fantastic it was so we should just play that clip except none of us are wearing the same shirt i didn't realize i did not get the memo i'm wearing <laughs> exactly change. the opposite that would have been a I good way wearing. to save ourselves 20 minutes this week we Holy. could have just like re like played back the recording from the first 20 minutes of last that week been smart. <laughs> welcome to the show everybody it's category 5 technology tv episode number 641 and i'm keeping track of my heart rate my steps everything else and you will be too because today May is the fifth Wednesday of the month. And then suddenly all of our shirts change. That's strange. Yeah. Marshman tells us in, in Discord that uh, that we are, in fact, on the air. So for you watching at home, wherever you're watching from, it's nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us this week. We do have an exciting show mm -hmm. planned for you. Uh, before we get into it, now, last week was the fifth week of January. And as yes. you know, on any month where we have five weeks, we do have a prize giveaway. Last week, we couldn't do it because of those technical difficulties. We're going to do that for you this week. We are giving away the fitness tracker that Robbie is wearing on his wrist. And this thing has been really quite great. Um, I love being able to track my steps, my heart rate, and my blood pressure. Um, some folks have said, well, those things are not really accurate when it comes to blood pressure. I really want to sit down at the pharmacy and put on oh, like one of that those pressure cuffs. You know, the, yeah, they've yes. got the pharmaceutical grade, like the same thing that the doctor uses at the pharmacy. You don't I wanna... just have like a telltale vein that pops out when your pressure gets to a certain point. <laughs> and I can just go like this and just be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that's one twenty yep, over. I'm stressed. Yeah. The feed's down again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's how I know. When you see that vein pop, you know Robbie's blood pressure is a little bit high It's today. like those guys from Star Trek, the aliens that like give you the visual um the fake visuals. You know how they trapped Kirk and oh, their we're heads going, were always We're pulsing. going back to like the original Yeah, series the original, here. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't remember their name, but I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I think about. It was, that was like the first episode. Sasha's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, were but they wearing red shirts? As, <laughs> no, they're wearing dresses. As far as the <laughs> blood pressure thing goes, though, I really want to see like how accurate is this? Um, some folks have said it's not that accurate, but it's been showing me some information about my blood pressure, which is right. cool. Yeah. Um, and I want to do that test and see right. how accurate is it compared to that pharmaceutical grade. But even if it's test. not bang on, it's a better indicator than what you had with no indication. One, right, which ooh, was just a guess. 131 over 84. <laughs> what am I doing wrong right now? We're talking about the feed being down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's like, oh, don't do that. See, <laughs> people have normal nightmares. Robbie wakes up screaming <laughs> that there's no feed. There's no feed. Yeah. Um, no, you're absolutely right, though, about the accuracy of this. This is not a medical device. No, of it, course not. What it is, is it's something that allows me to have some 
oversight into my own health. Right. So it doesn't have to be bang on accurate. It just has to give me something that I can graph, something yep. that I can understand, you know, how am I doing today? What kind of improvements have I made? Have I got more steps this this day than the other day? Or then your the, the answer is no. Or your coworkers? I but, showed her how many steps I got today and she laughed. Yeah, but I, I undercut those Out steps loud. by thirty three percent on Discord. I, we posted our photos. It's like you yes, were yes. 3,300 steps. I'm like 2,200 steps. You're not supposed to tell the viewers how poorly I'm doing today. But, but this that's an improvement. This device really... If, he's, if that's an improvement. If today's an improvement. No. Oh, I've <laughs> no. Sasha, I have finished day. some days with under 1,000 steps on my watch. Oh, my goodness. I hope you coma. were vacationing <laughs> sitting on a beach with a mojito. <laughs> Pretty much. I Let's hope, just say. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> so you can check your steps on yes, the fitness Yes, you will be able to if you win. you win. Yes. And you win by... Just simply post us in Discord. <laughs> oh, you're asking me. You could tell them. I know. But I was looking at my... Uh, uh, I really like being able to track my sleep. So right. I like being able to see how things affect my sleep. And it graphs it and it shows me how like my sleep I is win, impacted. I win at sleep. Yeah? Yeah. How, how long did you sleep last night? Last night, I we're doing? slept for eight hours. Oh, you win. But... Seven hours and night. So I was minutes. bang on my, ah, my 7 goal. 15. Wow. So I was bang on my goal last night. But I can actually graph it on my phone and see the quality of that sleep. I yes. love it. So, I mean, this is just a, an affordable kind of entry-level fitness tracker. I'm giving one away this week. Um, all you have to do is just message us in the Discord channel. Or if you're not on Discord, go on to our IRC um, and just message us your, your handle and where you are watching from. And just say something like, I want to qualify for that fitness we tracker. We are honoring you're gonna people write it from down. last week that did, right? <laughs> yeah, so Marshman is in there. And even like last week, you've brought broken the pen that's two weeks in a row <laughs> there's a reason why his blood pressure is 130 i'm yes. running i'm right oh, we're man. trying for continuity here this is how oh you yes do a pen. okay all right you got to figure it out i think so. sasha has figured out wow. how to use a pen and she is going to write down your name if you message us now if this you're watching this top tech news how to use a pen yes if you're watching <sighs> this after the fact if you're watching this on cable tv afterwards and you're like oh i really wish i could participate in these contests well there are opportunities for you to do that all you have to do is email live at category 5.tv let us know that you like to participate in the contest and we will include you as a ballot we'll include that email as a ballot in our next uh, our next draw so just yes. let us know where you're watching from and uh, that you'd like to participate in that draw how am i doing now so i'm down at 129 over 83 so i'm uh, I'm starting to settle. I'm, right. I'm ready to do a show now. You're as long as Sasha doesn't moment. break her pen again. Um, <sighs> yes. Do you yeah. know when the next fifth Wednesday is? I don't know. It's May? usually like is every three months or so. Oh, okay. Yeah, something like that. May? Watch your calendar, and every time you see a fifth Wednesday, you know that we're going to be doing a giveaway. So yep. that's how you know. All right, so before we get into tonight's show, I want to remind you to make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. Click that bell as well. That's going to make sure that you get those notifications every time we are live, <laughs> which we tend to do every five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Four out of five weeks. <laughs> I want you to get those notifications so that you know that we're live, so that you know that you can participate in the live show. Right. And again, if you're not able to be here for a live broadcast, we do provide this on demand and on cable TV, and we'd love to have you participate. You getting lots of names? So far. Fantastic. All right. Keep those coming in throughout the course of the show. There is no limit. Just get your ballot in. Uh, it's one ballot per person, uh, and all you have to do is just message us where you're watching from and that you'd like to win one of those fitness trackers and we will allow you to participate in that draw later on in the show yep all right so let's get into it first of all this week well last week <laughs> last week i received my pine book pro yes you did ansi edition yes what is ansi it's like, when you kind of get ooh, agitated ooh, and <laughs> No, it's a keyboard. <laughs> it's like the U.S. style keyboard. Yes, that's exactly right. So ANSI essentially means it's verbatim. It's like it's a synonym, synonym, <laughs> synonym, it's a synonym, synonym, a synonym for U.S. keyboard layout. So okay. when you think about a U.S. keyboard layout, you've got the slash in the right spot, and you've got everything where you expect it to be. If you're Canadian U.S., right. it's like the U.S. 104 keyboard. If you think about an ISO keyboard, that's kind of U.K. 
yep. um, like overseas for us. And so their layout is completely different. So right. we found the ISO layout to be really problematic here in Canada. Right. Yeah. Keys aren't where you want them to be. You got to push control, function, tab, alt, backspace, backspace, exclamation point in order to do an apostrophe. Like, it's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. No. And so Pine64 heard the cry of the Western world and said, you know what? We're going to bring out the U.S. keyboard layout on our next iteration of the Pine book. The Pinebook Pro is going to be available in both ISO and ANSI keyboard layouts. Nice. And this makes me very, very happy. So let's yes. get a look at uh, the unboxing here so you can see that my box, in fact, says ANSI. That is, again, the U.S. keyboard layout. You guys ready for this? Let's get into the box. Let's take a look, our first look at the Pinebook Pro ANSI edition. Here we go. And it's, box. Uh, it's another box. Wow. Look is at that. Is this one of those things where like, you get a box yes. inside a box inside box a box? inside a box inside a box, yes. Isn't that like called nesting, doll. do nesting dolls? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We've got... Okay, you ready for the next box? Here we go. Here we go. Fingers ready. crossed Everybody's for, ready for the next something box. not a box. Here we oh, that would be really nice if it was not a box. Maybe we could actually get a I Pine Book Pro. Plastic. Here we go. Oh, we've got some yeah. film and paper. Yes, we've got some packing foam. We've got a... Oh, look at that. A love letter from Pine64. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. My wife will be jealous. Uh, telling us all about it. Let's actually get a look at the Pine Book Pro. This has got to be it. That doesn't look like a box to me. I feel like we need some epic music or something oh, going yes. on. There we go. That's better. Uh, oh, not, nothing oh, else nothing in there. there. Okay. No other boxes. The box is empty now. <laughs> yep. All right. I've got my power supply that came with it. And let's take a look here. This is... Uh, now, I ordered the U.S. Type oh, okay. of power supply. So this just kind of oh, so it's a, that's yeah, uh, just kind of flips on, um, and it's a it is five volt, three amp, and as you can see, it's barrel and okay. not it's not USB C like the yeah. like the Raspberry Pi four. Okay. All right, here we go. Look at that! Oh. Beautiful. That's sleek. That is um, a magnesium alloy shell. Okay. Right so this is like a metal body. And we've got the micro SD. We've got a headphone jack and USB 2.0 right there on the side. Okay. Flipping around to the other side, we've got the barrel input for the power. We've got USB 3 and USB type C, which can be oh, okay. video output. It can be uh, power, whatever you like. Look at how thin and how streamlined thin is, is that. It? Oh, is that like boy, you're asking quarter, me to measure this? You can see quarter of an inch, half an inch. It's top. just so thin and so it's like a MacBook Air. But this, okay, I want to tell you, this is 200 bucks. Oh, That's amazing. I there have you are. Built a bigger cup of water on my. There's the keyboard right there. So this That's is the beautiful. ANSI keyboard. Look at the um, the slash key. It's in the right spot. Two is also the at. You can see the keyboard layout is what you would expect yes. here in Canada, yes. the United States. And that is the Pinebook Pro. So looking at the specifications, it's a 2 gigahertz rock chip RK3399 SoC. That's the same as a Rock Pro 64. Beautiful SoC. It's got a Mali T860 MP4 GPU. It's got 4 gigs of RAM, a 1080p IPS panel. Even though it's so sleek and so uh, so thin, it's got that nice monitor on there. It's got, uh, uh, it comes with a 64 gigabyte eMMC, which is upgradable if you want to add a little bit extra storage to that system um, and speaking of adding extra storage we need to be able to get into that that chassis yes. of the Pinebook Pro right because not only can you upgrade the eMMC but remember what I said the SOC is the same as the Rock Pro 64 well right. really the computer is the same as the Rock Pro 64 in a lot of ways mm -hmm. including PCI Express really what You've inside got PCI that? Express inside that little tiny thin notebook. And because of that, we can actually buy a $7 adapter that will allow us to install an M.2. Wow. So I can install an NVMe M.2 storage drive. So that means I could put up to two terabytes of storage that has no moving parts, That's generates amazing. very little heat, and is able to um, give me two terabytes of storage 
in my Pinebook Pro. That's amazing. Should we get a? Should we open this thing up? Yeah. And get a look. So on the underside, you see ten screws. Seems onerous. You know, you've got to open it up with ten screws, but we can speed that up for the sake of TV and get into this thing a little bit quicker. Um, but understand, that's going to give us access to the internal components. This is a hackable laptop. It is built to be something that we can modify ourselves. That's the key right. thing with the Pinebook Pro. But remember, it's only $200 US to buy this. It's available from Pine64, and they um, make this specifically to be a hackable Linux laptop. First time into it, let's get in there. Just want to be careful that I don't break anything, but there we go. Be mindful that the speakers are attached to the bottom panel. There are stereo speakers, oh. so be careful as you're pulling this up. You don't want to pull on that wire. See that? So oh. just kind of safely and carefully peel that back. And there you see the SOC. So that is the plastic component of the chassis. You can right. see how there is some plastic there. I'm going to put these speakers back before uh, I get too far ahead because I don't want to accidentally put them in the wrong spot. But let's get a quick close-up of that uh, that SOC, the, the, the main board, we'll call it, of the, uh, of the Pinebook Pro. This, again, is the ANSI edition. Yep. And under this little flap of tape, we have, this is what I was telling you about, Jeff. This is PCI Express X4, but it looks oh, a little bit different, yeah, right? Okay. So that's why you need that adapter. My storage, my hard drive is a 64 gig EMMC. Now, <laughs> ouch, be careful. I just cut myself. Uh, there are some sharp oh. points uh, within the case. So just be careful of that. Sorry about that, folks. But see that EMMC? It just goes right on there. You can upgrade that. It's just a standard EMMC. There's no proprietary part here. You can just buy a 128 gig if you want to upgrade that. And because it's an EMMC, you can pull that out. You can flash any distro onto that card and be able to boot up your Pinebook Pro. But I want to tell you something else. Remember how Remember how I showed you that there is a micro SD port on the side? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great because you can import photos from your camera. Sure. Okay. Yeah. However, it's also bootable. Really? Yes. Oh. Think about that for a second. So the boot order is micro SD and then EMMC. So even with that EMMC card in there, you can flash any distro for the Pinebook Pro to your micro SD card and boot it up. You can try it out, nice. find out how you like it. You can set it up the way you like it, and then you can wipe it and reflash and install a different distro and then boot it up from a micro SD card, and you never have to open up the chassis. Oh then, gosh. once you've decided the one that you really love... And there are a, a growing number of distros available for the Pinebook Pro. Once you find the one that you love, mm -hmm. you can flash that EMMC card, and that's the one that you're booting from when there's no micro SD in the slot. Like it. But a bootable micro SD. Huh. You have five micro SDs. You can just put, like, you can put Debian on one. It comes with Debian pre installed on that, mic on that EMMC that I showed you. Yep. So that has Debian stretch installed on it, ready to go. You can boot it up and start working. Um, but you can put Manjaro on there. You can put Ubuntu on another one. And you can boot from them and try them out and, uh, and give it a try without any risk to the actual built in EMMC. Very That's cool. How do you smart. like that? So if you intend to do that, if you want to flash your EMMC, make sure when you order your Pinebook Pro from Pine64.org that you also buy an EMMC to USB adapter. Right. Okay, that's important. So just keep that in mind. What else might you want to add to your cart? I would say probably that M.2 adapter for the PCI Express 4. Yep. I'd say that would be a good purchase. Throw that on there if you think that you're going to be doing that. I think I'm definitely going to pick up one of those sure. so that I can throw a one terabyte or two terabyte EMMC, or I keep saying that, M.2 on, onto the, uh, into the Pinebook Pro. That's mm -hmm. going to give me storage. So that's not bootable, but that is a storage hard drive. Right. So I can mount my home folder, for example, to that uh, M.2 <laughs> <laughs> and save all, like have a terabyte worth of home folder storage. That's awesome. How do you like that, right? That is so awesome. We're going to take a really quick break, but I have my Pinebook Pro set up here. I mentioned that it has USB-C video output. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be utilizing that to be able to show you the screen and actually walk you through the integrated OS, the Debian OS that comes with this Pinebook Pro right after this. Don't go anywhere. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. We're looking at the Pinebook Pro, and I've got the ANSI edition. That means that it has a U.S. keyboard layout, and there is also the ISO edition available for you at pine64.org. So make sure as you're checking out that you that you select the one that is the keyboard layout that you want. If you're in Canada and the U.S., you probably want the U.S. keyboard layout, and that is called ANSI, A-N-S-I. So I want to take a quick boo before we get into the news tonight. Okay at the actual interface. The EMMC comes with Debian Stretch pre-installed. And now, while I'm not booting from the EMMC because I, I wanted to, to really experience kind of different distros and things, so I installed that same distro downloadable off of their website onto a micro SD card. Okay. And here we go. So this is uh, what it looks like. So what I'm going to do, uh, I just want to make sure, actually, I'm going to share the same, I'm going to set the same screen so that you guys can see what I see. Oh, Let's have you see. got it on dual screen? Uh, it's on dual screen. So I'm going to instead set this to mirror. So what I'm seeing on my screen is I'm going to drag this over for you so that you can see because it's actually operating as two monitors. Oh, nice. Okay. So on my screen here, I'm going to check that checkbox that said, so this is over USB-C. So it actually has a video output and I've selected to show the same thing on both screens. So uh, presumably if I hit apply, this is really awkward because that screen is actually... <laughs> Not a real screen. There we go. Okay, so keep this configuration, and now we can both see the exact same screen. So you and I are looking at the same screen here. So that's USB-C output, and that's important to note, and I wanted you to see that because if you plug that USB-C into like the HDMI of your TV, you'll be like, well, why is it not showing the same thing? Mm -hmm. You need to bring up the display, the monitor preferences, and select that you want it to be the same so image the on all monitors. So that setting to have the dual screen? It will put it on two different screens. So that is dual. So it is a dual screen the setup, default. yeah. Cool. So all I've done is I've bought for six bucks off of Amazon just a USB-C to HDMI adapter. Yep. It's just a cable. It's really, really cheap, cheerful, and it makes it work. So as you can see, um, um, I'm able to stream live the the screen just as I see it, and it's working absolutely flawlessly. So this is the default de facto distro, and this is Debian Stretch, and has basically everything that you need to get up and going. So let's see what we've got. So under accessories, I've got LeafPad text editor, uh, Vim <laughs> text editor for you hackers out there, uh, graphics. It comes with uh, not a whole lot, actually. We probably want to install the GNU Image Manipulation Program. We've talked yep. about that on the show. Uh, internet. We've got Chromium and Firefox. Very nice. Because apparently you need both. <laughs> um, Hex Chat will get you into IRC. Office. Let's see what we have. LibreOffice. Perfect. So you've got your that's basic... That's everything you need. Yeah, that's like Writer and so Microsoft Office equivalent for Linux. Uh, sound and video. We've got... Oh, now I installed Cheese because I, I wanted to point out that we actually have a built-in uh, webcam on this system. So this is a 1080p webcam. And even though with Cheese booted here, so this is going to presumably... There we go. You can see that the, the frame rate is really, really poor right right oh, there are you in doing cheese. the robot i am i'm, I'm really good at the robot <laughs> but but it it does work really quite well and the picture looks pretty good uh let's take a quick why don't now, we is that just a setting as to why it's so low well i don't know yeah <laughs> i think what we're gonna find is that with something like the pinebook pro and i think this is important to note and maybe this is something i should have mentioned right off the top what it is, this is, let's consider it experimental. Mm -hmm. Let's consider this something that is bleeding edge and mind blowing. Yeah. Let's say if you are a Linux lover, if you love to tinker, this might be a notebook for you. Yeah. Because you're probably going to run into little issues like that. Did you see the countdown? One, two, three, two, one. And it was like all gibberish. So there's something wrong there. And I'm going to probably have to figure that out if I, if I care. But see, um, I kind of thought it was a cool feature. It looked like a flash. <laughs> there you go. It's like three, two, one to prepare. And that's like screen flash. It's like, oh, okay, cool. But it didn't really look like a three, did it? It was like gibberish. But it kind of reminds me of like the first ever episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. That's exactly what this looks like. Um, but it, I mean, there is a webcam. Yeah. Yes. Big deal. Yeah. So there's, there's a community that 
is involved in all Pine64 products. And mm-hmm. that's a big part of this, is that you can get into the community and say, hey, my webcam seems a little bit choppy, or maybe the cheese is having some weird issues. Well, you can get into the, the chat, the, like the and that's on IRC through HexChat, or you can get into the forums and talk to them about that and, and get some help. Um, we've got media players. We've got uh, your standard kind of Linux system tools. Um, speaking of, let's bring up like system monitor and let's just kind of see what this looks like. Hold on for a second. So this is a $200 Linux notebook computer that's this thin, That's a, a that has no moving parts. So if I can, I don't know if you can really get your head around that at home, but when this is sitting on my lap, there's no fan noise. Yep. There's very little heat and a little bit of heat off of the one side where the SOC is. That's the system on chip, the C, what we would call a CPU. Yep. Uh, there's a little bit of heat there, but it's dissipated quite well. Um, but really, like, there's no noise coming off of no, it. No, there's whatsoever. none whatsoever. So you don't have any of those moving parts that you do on a normal traditional laptop. So what have I been using this for? Well, it's not a super powerful laptop, but it's quite good as far as no, I mean, getting on the internet. It's a day. it's a single board computer built into a laptop yeah. chassis essentially, but. It's got a great keyboard now. It's got a nice touchpad. You've got to update the touchpad uh, firmware. Make sure you do that right out the gate. There's some updates that you need to install. You'll find out more about that in the Pine64 forums. Mm -hmm. Very, very important for for the sensitivity and and accuracy of that. Um, But we've got 4 gigs of RAM. And what I've been using this for is I use it as a terminal for my main computers so if you understand that's already how i work Mm -hmm. i don't like to carry a big workstation of a laptop they call it a portable workstation i used to do that i used to buy the the seventeen hundred dollar portable workstation that i would do my video production on and it was this thick and it had big honking fans in it or you might have like one of those big republica gamer laptops that are like this you know the same thing because you want all that power the way i work now as a video producer is i have a honking server that honking server has all the power in the world that i'll ever need and then i use any terminal to be able to connect into it and bring up its screen. So on this $200 notebook computer that weighs a feather weight, Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a coffee shop on their Wi-Fi, VPN'd into my studio, and I'm doing video editing on my screen on uh, a $7,000 production system. Oh, You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So this becomes a terminal. So it's brilliant for that. It's proven itself to be brilliant for that. But at the same time, it's also great without that capability to just use it as web surfing, use it for for your standard, like everything's online these yeah. days. If you're using um, Google Drive, you probably yep. have a lot of your stuff just right in there. So let's get a quick boo at this system itself, because I mean, the the real question is, okay, if I'm not using it connected to a big powerful system, is it still going to work as a, a pretty decent computer? One of the things that you're going to notice is down here at the bottom right, it's jumping around between 408 megahertz to 1.42 gigahertz and so on. It's jumping all over the place because it's selecting the processor frequency based on my usage. So it's right. getting faster and it's giving more power, taking more juice from the 10,000 milliamp hour battery mm-hmm. uh, based on my requirements. Right. But if I'm not really doing much, if it's idling, it'll just clock itself down to 408 megahertz, which is going to use very, very little power. Yeah, exactly. Presumably. All right. So I'm just going to cancel out of that guy and let's jump onto YouTube because that's probably, you know, I don't know about you. But if things are not playing well on YouTube, then that's a real, that's a write off for me. I want videos on YouTube to work really, really well. Right. That's a key thing. Uh, So fairly quick. Uh, yeah, it loads okay. So, um, I mean, everything looks good. And I'm just doing this with the touchpad. So I'm doing multi touch right now. So as I scroll, I'm using two fingers to scroll. Mm hmm. That's how I do it. So, and you can, if you want, you can go over to the scroll bar and click and pull down. But I like to just use multi touch. Uh, it's just a little bit quicker. So, if I wanted to click on any of these videos, so let's go to something that's fairly current. Let's go to our ESET video here. And there's an ad that's playing. So, it jumped up real quick. That's Looks really quick. good, real smooth. And skip the ads. 
It's switched to 18 over 9. How do you like that? Oh, it looks like I've already clicked on this video. So let's reverse. Again, using multi-touch to rewind there. I double tapped on the scroll bar and then can scroll. There you go. Um, looks a great. Yeah. Let's full screen it. See if it cacks out. No, looks good. Everything's looking pretty good there. So sound is a little bit tinny, as you can expect from a lap, like a, a, a low uh, priced laptop. But I want to be clear when I when I say that, that it, it has Bluetooth 5. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about that for a second. So you've got a Bluetooth speaker externally and you can you can connect this to your Bluetooth speaker. And then or those Bluetooth good. headphones. Bluetooth that we headphones. A couple of weeks Bluetooth ago. headphones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so those speakers that are a little bit tinny, you saw them when I unbox, uh, when I opened it up, just a little, little tiny speakers. You can either use the headphone jack. There is that, uh, over here, or you can use Bluetooth headphones, Bluetooth speakers, and you're going to get much better sound as well. Very cool. Uh, so that's really, really nice. Neat. Um, I have to say 200 bucks. Well worth it's, it. Oh, well worth it. Oh, it's been a dream. Like, just like I've been using a, I've been using a Lenovo ThinkPad, yep. and it's beautiful. But mm -hmm. it is, it's big and heavy, mm -hmm. clunky, and and it's a nice notebook. But it it feels heavy on my lap, and this thing just feels like a feather. Like it's just there's nothing to it. It's so thin. It's so lightweight, and just and the battery lasts. It seems forever. Um, and you, and, and I just love using it. It's not so expensive that you would be like so anxious if you take it somewhere. You, no, you would, not at all. Yeah, you could you well, could take it and tinker. I mean, yeah, I, I'm looking yeah. at this and I'm going, you know what? Our oldest son is going into high school next year. Oh yes, mm -hmm. this would be a great computer for him. Brilliant. Yes, for schooling. Sure. Yeah. If if he can if, see the thing with education, and it's a sad place right now in the Canadian education system, is that they don't teach. Um, skills. They teach software. That's true. And so when you go to school, when you pay to go to college, you're paying to learn Microsoft Office. That is yeah. true. Actually. Not the skill sets. The, so so yes. to translate that from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice can be a challenge. So yeah. I'll, give, I'll give you that one little caveat. Um, and, it's, and that is a problem. Uh, but that's a problem in the education sector. Right. That's not a problem with this device. Um, and I think if we have a good troubleshooting mind and, and maybe a, a father who is willing to take the time to, to help their son and, and show them, okay, well, yeah, in, in Microsoft Word, it's like that, but in LibreOffice, it's like this. It's well, similar. It's very, very close, but it's a little bit different. But see, uh, we have a dual boot system, yeah. both Linux and Windows. Yeah. And on Windows, I also have um, Microsoft Office and um Libre. Office. Okay. Yep. So they use both, but for a lot of their school, it's all on Google Docs. That's true. So they're yes. writing Google Docs anyway, so Brilliant. it doesn't matter to them. So this is like, so consider this like, so you say 200 bucks. Oh, well, that's about the price of a good high-end Chromebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? But this is full Linux. Yeah. I installed Debian Linux on this. You can install Manjaro or Ubuntu, and it's the full operating system. Anything that's in Synaptic Package Manager, I installed Cheese. I mentioned wanting to install um, uh, the GNU Image Manipulation Program, right? So what am I going to do? It's just like you would on your, on your Linux machine. Mm -hmm. Bring up Synaptic Package Manager. That's w where I am on, on Debian anyways. Um, and do a search and type in GIMP. And guess what we're going to find? No guesses? <sighs> GIMP. There it is. Look at nice. that. Right? So I can just install it just because it's Linux. It's not a Chromebook. Right. So it's like the price of a Chromebook, a, a good high end one, but it's full Linux. And I love, I love that. But do keep in mind, there are some like development caveats sure. so you've got to be willing to work those out yep. right now there are a little bit of things that are like for a novice user might drive them nuts for someone like myself i love it and yeah. i can forgive those things yep. um things like um if i close the lid right now when it goes to sleep and i open it and push the power button it won't wake up well that's a problem they're working on it it'll be yeah. fixed but right now i just know don't close the lid <laughs> Exactly. It boots. It boots so darn fast Very that quick. if I shut it down and turn it back on again, I don't. I don't care. Yeah. It doesn't affect me. But you. So you learn these little quirks about it. 
because it is a very new system and it's a very new uh, it's a, an entirely new realm for Linux notebooks. Mm. I mean, this is an SOC, a single board computer built into a beautiful laptop chassis, and you've got access to, to a full Debian or, or any uh, compatible Linux distro that on that awesome. system. How cool is that? Now, for somebody who's going, hey, I'd be open to this, Yeah, but what happens if I mess something up? Well, then like, just wipe your SD card and re and reflash. Exactly. exactly. Un- mess yeah. it up. Like, sure. that's the great part. I mean, if you're doing something on your Windows machine and you mess it up, it's like, oh, my goodness. Now I like, <laughs> oh. reinstall. No, but reflash. This, it takes yeah, four re- minutes. Which is amazing. <laughs> totally awesome. Yeah. Now, because this has the extra micro, micro SD for booting. Yeah. Um, could you put, say, like RetroPie on that micro SD and boot up RetroPie? That is a great question. On a, on a micro SD. Well, you'd have to have a, a Rock 64, or Pinebook 64 compatible version of RetroPie. So yeah. what you would need to do, I think, would be instead to take the approach of installing Debian and then installing RetroPie on top of that. Okay, so it's enough. a little bit different. I don't think there's anyone doing a RetroPie gaming system for the Rock, uh, for the Pinebook Pro yet. Okay. Um, but I'm not entirely certain of that. It's just a distro. It's a, yeah. it's a Debian based or Ubuntu based distro. Um, so it could be done. Yeah. It's just, I don't know if anyone's doing it right Ameritroid now. Ameritroid said that there is an update. PBP, um, was updated so that when he closes his lid, wait a bit, reopen it, push yeah. the, bu- the power button and it works fine. Oh, so oh yeah. There you, go. you just need an update. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> probably. As I say, people are like it's folks good. in the community are working on it. Yeah. And you can jump into the chat, um, the the forum, and they'll tell you all about where where it's at. Um, I've had a, a strange thing where it reboots once in a while, but I found if I if I hard set the frequency of the CPU, mm-hmm. it doesn't do it anymore. Oh. And we've seen tonight that it didn't do it as as well. And I didn't change that setting. So I think one of the updates have just simply fixed that. Now you know it'd be interesting and. Let me know if this is slightly off base. Okay. To take the Rock Pro 64. That's the single board computer version. That, of this. Yeah. And run a giggle score against this. And see if this compares. Yeah. Uh, they should be. They're the same SOC. They're the same RAM. Right. But just because there's a few other components added in, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Mm. Right. Mm. Yeah, we could do that. Sure. I think that'd be interesting. Just yeah. for fun. Anybody in the community want to do that? Give it a go. Run a giggle score on a Pinebook Pro. Um, we are this week. We've looked at the ANSI keyboard edition, and while the ISO version came out late 2019, the ANSI version just came out in uh, early 2020. And so this is like the brand new creme de la creme for uh, American and Canadian users. So and uh, I'm very, very pleased with it. Very impressed. And this could be a daily driver, absolutely. Especially oh, because sure. the video production I can do with a remote connection to my main server, yeah. which has Windows 10 and, and my video production suite, which is uh, DaVinci Resolve. So, um, so this is like, this is a brilliant little terminal for mm-hmm. me, yeah. So check it out, pine64.org. In the meantime, Sasha, if you are ready, we're going to jump right over to your newsroom. Excellent. Mm Mm-hmm. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Some of the biggest Call of Duty, Overwatch, and Hurtsome eSport leagues will be streamed exclusively on YouTube. Rocket League is ending support for Linux and Steam OS. We're in an Antarctica frenzy as Google Earth as a Google Earth user has found a 2,000 foot structure emerging from the snow. And sometimes free isn't actually free at all. It's been revealed that a vast free antivirus is tracking users' online behavior and mining the data. Stick around; the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. And joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. All right, some quick honorable mentions this week. Uh, the good old FreeDB CD database service that uh, and its services will be shut down on March 31st, 2020. Now, there are dozens of applications that make it uh, easy to rip a music CD to your computer, saving digital versions of the tracks as MP3 or WAV or FLAC or even other audio files. But one of the key services many of those applications rely on is set to shut down at the end of March. 
FreeDB is a free online database of track listings of millions of CDs. Without this type of database, you'd either end up having to um, have a bunch of nameless files, or you'd have to manually type in the album names, the artist info, the song titles, and other data into your computer every time you rip a CD. While FreeDB isn't the only service of its type, it's been one of the most prominent services providing track listing data for nearly two decades. FreeDB data was originally based on information from the CDDB data service, uh, which eventually became proprietary software and prohibited lic uh, unlicensed applications from using the data. So FreeDB... Wow, FreeDB, CDDB, it all runs together, doesn't it? Uh, but they are a free service operated under a GPL license, and it now consists of user-generated data. So service company Magix acquired FreeDB in 2006 and continued to support the free service until now. It's unclear why Magix has decided to pull the plug after all of these years. Fortunately, there's an alternative online music database called Music Brains that's operated under a Creative Commons license that effectively places the data into the public domain, uh, which means it should continue to work with third-party software indefinitely, no matter what. But if you're using an old CD ripping service or music management software that only supports FreeDB, it may be time to look for some kind of alternative. In an odd turn of events, Microsoft has had to push out an update for Windows 7, despite the operating system reaching end of support because they need to fix a bug that they introduced. Earlier this month, Microsoft ended support for Windows 7 and released final public security updates for computers still running the over a decade old OS. However, that final update included the addition of a bug that affects desktop wallpapers, causing wallpapers set to stretch mode to display as a black screen. Organizations who wish to continue using Windows 7 beyond the end of support date must pay for extended security updates. In other words, Microsoft ended support for Windows 7 by introducing a bug that companies would have to pay them to fix. Initially, Microsoft said it was developing a fix that they would roll out to those who purchased extended support. However, they've since caved. They've changed their minds and patched uh, the patches being made available to everybody running Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1, which was also affected. Wow. Finally, at FOSDEM this week, Pine64 have announced what they're up to for the first half of 2020. During this time, the company hopes to review the status of the Pine Phone and Pine Time, release the Pine Tab Early Adopter Edition, and make good on their promises to deliver the upgrade kit for the original Pine Book. Also rolled over from last week's to-do list, or last week's, last year's to-do list. They're falling a little further behind than just one week. Pine64 is releasing a new SoPine compute module that features a neural processing unit. The SoEdge is a three-tops module that can be paired with the SoPine baseboard or USB 3.0 and PCI Express adapters for development. And it can even be mixed with previous Gen A64 modules on the cluster board, which allows clustering of up to seven compute modules. It can connect to a single board computer such as the Rock Pro 64 or a regular PC with a simple PCI Express riser card. Now, Having encountered issues with the Sony camera implementation and with the big devices that they've been releasing, like the Pinebook Pro and the Pine Phone um, in the works in Q4 2019, the Cube camera got put on the back burner. But Pine64 also assures us that they are once again working on that. They're going to need to make some modifications to the specs, though, and we're going to learn more about that in Pine64's February community update, which is going to be posted on February 15th. So that's a lot of stuff that has been rolled over from 2019 into 2020, uh, which is going to keep them very busy. But at this point, Pine64 is also wanting to announce things that they are confident they're going to be able to deliver early May 2020 uh, at, as a deadline. So anything that's going to be released in the first couple of quarters this year. It's been a while since Pine64 has announced a new single board computer. And in fact, um, with all of the other devices that they've been bringing out, 
Some users have even questioned if they're going to be getting out of the SBC industry altogether. But that is not the case. Pine64 has announced the new... Hard Rock 64. The Hard Rock 64 features the same SB, uh, SOC. It's the RK3399 Hexacore SOC that you find in the Pinebook Pro and the Rock Pro 64. It's got two USB 3, two USB 2 ports, Wi Fi AC, Bluetooth 5.0, gig Ethernet. And unlike the Raspberry Pi 4, which only offers micro SD for storage, the Hard Rock 64 includes EMMC. Nice. Also, the contrast, uh, also by contrast, the Hard Rock 64 has a barrel jack for power and no USB C. Like the Raspberry Pi six, uh, Raspberry Pi four, it comes in three different RAM sizes. There's one gigabyte, two gigabytes, and four gigabytes. The three implementations of the Hard Rock sixty four will be available at around thirty five dollars, forty five dollars, and fifty five dollars, respectively. The board is going to run Rock Pro 64 OS images, and with a small tweak, it should even be able to run most of the Pinebook Pro distros as well. So if you don't need all of the Rock Pro 64's functionality, such as PCI Express or USB-C, then this may be the perfect board for you. Pine64 hopes to have the Hard Rock Pro Hard Rock 64. <laughs> All of them start to run together. They hope to have it available for you this April. Nice. That is awesome. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Some of the biggest Call of Duty, Overwatch, and Hearthstone esports leagues will be streamed exclusively on YouTube. The deal scene is a big win for the platform, which has found it hard to compete with the game streamer Twitch. It's part of a deal that the sites signed with Activision Blizzard, the company which runs the leagues, Twitch exclusively streamed for the first two seasons of Overwatch League and is seen as the go-to destination for live gaming. For sure. Sunil Ryan, head of gaming at Google Cloud, says, quote, We've worked closely with Activision Blizzard for the past few years across mobile titles to boost its analytics capabilities and overall player experience. We're excited to now expand our relationship and help power one of the largest and most renowned game developers in the world, end quote. Despite being the largest video site in the world, YouTube has historically struggled to compete with sites like Twitch. But in the last few months, the platform's been making some high-profile moves, poaching a number of high-profile Twitch streamers. As a part of the deal, the search giant's cloud platform will power all of Activision Blizzard's game hosting and other technical needs. Google Cloud will also host Activision Blizzard's entire library of games. That's a, quite a change in, in the landscape of video games. Gameplay on online? It, it is. Twitch has always been like, that's where you go for gameplay. Well, yeah. And I mean, the fact that they've now just secured those three games makes me wonder, could this either force Twitch to adapt or mm. put them under? Be, be the end. Yeah. Like if YouTube can start pulling away from Twitch and saying, you know what, we've got this. Yeah. And if they can show that, hey, we've done it better. Right. Then mm. other Twitch streamers are going to go, eh, you know what, I can go here. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting, though, is it talked about the fact that they pulled some of the high-profile Twitch streamers, so I'm wondering if there's a different compensation rate versus what you would normally get on, on YouTube. It's a really weird landscape, though, because we can't produce video on YouTube for children. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the so the games are going to have to be adult-centric. Uh, I Or at least the, the, to be, the commentary. To be honest, with most of these, they already are. Yeah. So, so what we're going to see, so understand what that means is that, okay, so the YouTube game, uh, like the the community of gamers on YouTube is going to grow into an adult centric video service. Right. So, well, so then maybe like Twitch foul language, um, probably well, some not necessarily. Um, I mean, yeah, necessarily. I mean, you're you're gonna get some of it for sure. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you look at some of those older YouTubers like Dan TDM, who's been around forever. Yeah, but how's he doing with YouTube right now? As far as I know, he's still doing videos. My kids are watching him all the time. How are the ads looking? Mm. 
I haven't question. noticed anything. I don't know. I'd have to check on, on Dan and see how things are going. But the, see, the thing is, is that as soon as COPPA came in, it really impacted streamers who, yes. like Dan has always been very, he's been very centric on, on children and uh, ch children's entertainment. Yes. And because of that, that will impact his revenue because under COPPA, he is not allowed to generate revenue based on children viewing his stream. Right. So he would have to generate adult centric videos in order to generate any revenue. Now, I mean, at the end of the day though, YouTube isn't going to know whether it's me on my phone watching or my kids on my phone. But even if right, like, regardless, but of Dan the, can't I, take that risk. No, I hear you. But I mean, how, how does that force the content to change? Because Dan has to select. So we're talking about Dan TDM here. Yeah. He has to select when he creates a video that this is created for children. That the, that the content is appealing to children. And if he selects right. that, he is not allowed to monetize it. So whether it's you mm. or whether it's a child watching it, there are no ads that are monetizing it for him. So he's, right. not, ma he's not making any money off of those videos. So then he just says it's for adults. Somebody came into... Very, yeah, but, very, very young adults. But if a child is... See, then he's taking a risk because it's not. And they could shut him down very, very quickly. Right. Fair right? enough. Okay. And this so is a legal issue. It'll be interesting yeah. to see with, with this switch then, because you're right. A lot of the viewers are teens. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, when it comes to 13 plus is okay. Oh, then they're full. Yeah. They're fine. Yeah. But as soon as any, anyone under 13 is watching that, that has to be selected by the streamer. Right. And if it is selected by the streamer, we're not allowed to monetize it. So then, I mean, with oh. the switch from Twitch to YouTube, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact because all of those games at the end of the day, when you look at the, was it, e, uh, ERT rating or whatever. Yes, but, but right now on Twitch, nobody's monitoring. Kappa hasn't cracked down on Twitch. So Twitch. So those, yes. those streamers are still making money off of the 10 year olds. That's right. Right. So right? Twitch is still. Which I, I'm not saying whether I agree or don't agree. I'm just saying that. So the, that is going to be a strange shift because in, in order to monetize, they have to specifically make their programming for 13 plus. They cannot create programming that is appealing to 10 year olds. Right. To 11 year olds, to 12 year olds. But the difference between a 10 year old and a 13 year old, not really that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I guess I'm just viewing it from a different lens than you. I can say I'm gearing it to 13 year olds <laughs> and if a 10 year old watch it, so be it. No, but I'm can't. gearing it for but 13 not... because the law will crack down on you with that attitude. It's so weird. Yeah. But, but if that's okay. the case, I mean, how many kids do you like? I mean, I remember getting uh, movies rented that were 18 a no, sorry, R. Are, You're like, the church ho boy. Like horror flicks and stuff <laughs> when I was 14. So like uh, you can't stop. Well, yeah, we're not going to be able to solve this we, in this moment. That we is... cannot account for your crimes, Jeff. <laughs> I think this is fine. I don't think I don't think they're going to notice an issue. I really don't. I oh, think dear. they're going to be able to, to stream on YouTube and I think they'll be fine. We'll see. Okay. What the, do you the, think? The, the initial Comment blip will below. be them getting Are you a streamer? new subscribers. Are you a game streamer on Twitch? What are your opinions? Let us know. Comment below. Yeah, please. Just three and a bit years after it debuted on the platform, Rocket League is ending support for Linux and Steam OS. Psyonix, the development team behind the popular Cars Meets Football game, announced the end of Mac OS and Linux support in a short statement posted on their website. They say, quote, as we continue to upgrade Rock, Rocket League with new technologies, it is no longer viable for us to maintain support for the Mac OS and Linux, Linux or Steam OS platforms. As a result, the patch for the OS and the Linux versions of the game will be in March. This update will disable online functionality such as in-game purchases for players on Mac OS and Linux, but offline features including local matches and split-screen play will still be accessible." End quote. Last year, Psyonix was acquired by Epic Games, who announced plans to stop selling the hit game on Steam, though without impacting players who had already purchased it. But it's not all bad news. If you already own the game, you can continue to play it on Linux without any limitations until the March update arrives. 
After this, you can also continue to play it just without any of the online capabilities. Don't forget that if you bought Rocket League for Linux on Steam, you can still access full functionality, including online play, by installing it on a computer running a supported version of Windows. Not an ideal solution, but at least you don't totally lose your purchase. Burn, Linux yeah. users. What? I agree. However, how many avid gamers are Linux users? All of them. Yes. I like to believe. But you don't see people using Linux for the purposes of gaming. That is, maybe, that is true. Maybe that's part of this, too, is that, okay, my kids play that on the Switch. Rocket League is like the Nintendo Switch all the right. way. Now, right now, yeah, yeah, I'd say the Switch is where it's at. So... I will say that we had to install window, wah, wah, Windows on oh, my for computer gaming. because of gaming. Yeah, because right. you got the VR headset and everything. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. But for sure. But that's why that's... I have Windows on my computer. Like, I have Steam with my 300 okay. games on it. Yeah, fair enough. And so for that reason, I, I need can Windows. I, can I have access to your account? Four hundred games. You can share About your library. I have three I games. You can share I, your I've had. <laughs> I signed up for Steam when it initially came out. <clears throat> After the show in the credits, watch for it. We're gonna have Jeff Steam password. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, but I mean, I don't think this is such a big deal. I mean, you typically don't see gamers running on Linux. And but if, here's the thing: I, I wish that it was a big deal. I wish that there was more of a, a wave toward Linux. Sure. Based. Yeah, Jeff. I, I, think I agree, but the you're looking at it in the current in the current, um, like this is now. Yep. Not a lot of gamers on Linux. Okay, so think about this. Well, the the product's already on Linux. Yeah. Let's keep supporting it, and let's continue supporting Linux as a gaming platform because it's a great gaming platform. But Steam, if they're, Steam OS, for right. example. But if right? from a monetary standpoint, they're finding that the return on investment for having programmers that will deal with it on a Linux base is not viable on the long term based on subscribership then it totally makes sense it's a business decision i can't yeah. i can't fault somebody for that i don't know i feel like it's a build it and they will come sort of situation they just need I'm to i'm sorry they are kind of, they're not kevin costner and we're not dealing with ghosts all i care is that unreal tournament runs on linux yeah <laughs> i don't care about anything else in this that entire is the world one thing yeah yeah I know. That's but true. that's how uh, you know that's 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 I mean, it's unfortunate that to me they're not investing in Linux right. anymore, but yeah. it doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, it's not like you go... It still breaks my heart, Jeff. It oh, is sure. Yeah. I still, I wish that I could choose a different operating system, but I need Windows to play my games. I need to. Okay. I need to. Right. So okay. dual booting is a, a dual booting for the win. So yes. Windows 10 for gaming, Linux for Linux everything for else. All that's other what things. Everything else. But it doesn't have to be that way. Game developers need to realize. That's right. Exactly. We could just have Linux and then... Like, make this world a better place. DaVinci Resolve is on Linux. So just bring bring Rocket League back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. We've got to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech, new tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Antarctica frenzy is Google a uh, Google Earth user has found a 2,000 foot structure emerging from the snow. Google Earth users have claimed for years that there are mysteries lying beneath the Antarctica ice. And now Google user er, Google Earth user Mr. MBB333 thinks he may have discovered a gigantic building in Antarctica. In footage shared a couple of weeks back, he zooms in on the location to find what seems like a huge square emerging from the ice. The narrator explains, quote, from the top to bottom, it's nearly 2,000 feet. Unbelievable. I didn't think it was that big. It's six football fields long. That's massive. It's very large, very symmetrical, and looks like a building. This could be a random piece of ice, I suppose. It is kind of offshore. Maybe it's some sort of building, but that is huge, end quote. While many are speculating what the shape could be, others are less convinced, suggesting it was nothing more than an unusual shaped 
block of ice. Antarctica is often the center of conspiracy theories, with so-called truth seekers believing that beneath the layer of snow and ice lies remnants of everything from ancient civilizations to Nazi bases. Back in August, another Google Earth user believed that they had spotted a gigantic statue of a face. And just two weeks ago, one person claimed to have spotted a huge two-mile-long ancient wall rising above the ice. The so-called monolith was compared to a ziggurat, a massive structure built in ancient Mesopotamia and Iran. Isn't that cool that we live in a time right now that we, as like just average users yeah. at home, can look from the satellite, basically, down on the and earth. Be like, I like see that's this. sci-fi from the '80s, exactly. right there. Yeah. Okay, but here's what I have to say about this, and I I don't know whether or not these structures actually exist, but to me, it's reminiscent of like gazing at the clouds and being like, I see a hippopotamus. I don't know. It looks pretty <laughs> much like a structure to yeah. me. It could be a structure. Do you or remember not. It the could be. great Google Earth murder mystery? No. Never of, heard about of that. Of the dock with the blood splatter and the trail into the water. No. And everybody was freaking out about this murder do you, scene. Do which, you know about this? It, it's, it's kind this, of ringing. This about. happened probably five, six years ago, and everybody was freaking out that they had that Google Earth had taken a snapshot of a murder scene. Oh. And because you see the dock, you see the, the trail of blood to the water. This has gotten really morbid. Right. But turns all of a out, sudden, turns out, yeah, it was a guy with his dog, and the dog was jumping in the water, running around, running across the dock, and it was the, the wet water. dock, and it made it look like blood. So the, the point of this is, just because you see it on Google Earth doesn't mean it is what you think it is. That's true. But there's not a whole lot of action going on in Antarctica. But doesn't matter. You can't look at something as a topographical view oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and go, look, it's, it's 2,000 feet tall. Oh, look at that. It's the it's actually the shadow of a penguin. Right? I, like, yeah. come on. I will say I spend some time in Google Earth on my VR. Like, yeah. And by some time, I mean on the daily. Because um, I love to travel around and just see places. So mm -hmm. I now need to go to Antarctica because I haven't. Oh. But I, I just, I mean, I don't, I, first off, it's Antarctica. So no matter where, where you are in the world at the end of the, not the world, but like this time of year, you're always going to have the sun at a very horizontal angle. So it's going to create different shadows. That's why that penguin looks like a giant building. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not buying it. I don't think so. No? I don't think it's a 2,000 foot structure. The amount of planes and surveillance, an story. it's not going to happen. I think the only valid use for Google Earth is to see where viewers are watching from <laughs> right now. Right. And, and so by clicking on to map.cat5.tv, we can start to see just outside of the royal town of Sutton Coldfield, we've got viewers and we should be able to zoom all over the place. Yeah. Viewers, all over. where are we right now? This I don't is... know. You're quite zoomed in. I know. Oh, there's oh, Denmark. Denmark. Yeah. We yeah. know Denmark. <laughs> so this is this is a valid this use is for awesome. Oh, there's didn't Germany. We have, didn't we have a yeah. viewer in Antarctica? Do we? Let's I, let's I thought we did, like, maybe we weeks can ago. find our viewers in Antarctica. Oh, it's gonna I mean They're watching from a two thousand foot structure. Yeah. Oh, where <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's somebody in Iceland. Nobody in Greenland. That's not the same. No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> That's not not the same. <laughs> Listen to you. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to circumnavigate here, and you it doesn't. Do it. No, yeah, it's, it's in live mode, so it doesn't like interactivity. But hey, map.cat5.tv. I'm not see buying. It. I'm sorry. I, All right, Jeff doesn't buy it. Jeff I'm, doesn't buy it. Do you oh, buy I'm it? Game. I'm game. Is it a penguin, or is it a structure? It's. That's it's the question. Likely. Comment below. <laughs> it turns out. Free security solutions may come at the cost of all of your browsing data. A vast free antivirus tracker, tracker tracks users' online behavior and mines the data for companies like Microsoft, Pepsi, and Google. Windows users should know by now that you're walking into a field of landmines if you run your computer without protection from malware. So most people use antivirus software to make sure that they get some much needed privacy and security protections while using their computers online. 
and many, to the tune of about a half billion users, turn to free antivirus products, thinking that there's no reason to pay for protection since there are programs available for free. However, free security suites can sometimes hoard your browsing data and other details and sell them to third parties. Mm -hmm. This is the case with the popular free antivirus from Avast, which is putting the privacy of around 400 million people at risk. At a time when high-profile tech executives are calling on governments to impose more stringent privacy rules, there's nothing like another reminder that everyone is fighting to get a hold of your habits, preferences, and pretty much any other data that can be used by advertisers to target you more easily. According to a joint investigation by Vice and PC Mag that involves leaked contracts and other comp company documents, Avast, along with its AVG subsidiary, have been keeping track of what users did online while using the free software they distribute. The scheme involves JumpShot, a company that, quote, provides insights into consumers' online journeys by measuring every search, click, and buy across 1,600 categories from more than 150 sites, including Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Walmart, end quote. Installing Avast's free antivirus automatically adds in a browser extension that collects information on your internet activity and sends it to JumpShot, packed and tagged with the unique identifier. Avast data collection includes searches on Google and Google Maps, YouTube videos, LinkedIn searches and profile visits, and even what users view on adult websites. This gets sent to JumpShot's customers like Google, Microsoft, Pepsi, Sephora, Home Depot, Yelp, Intuit, and many others. Avast says it doesn't track any sensitive information like personal identification, phone numbers, or email. The company also insists that as of July 2019, they had begun implementing an explicit opt-in choice for all new downloads of their AV and are now prompting existing free users to make an opt-in or opt-out choice, a process which they claim will be completed in February 2020. Okay, opt in. Like, do you like, want, like, yes, 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 yes. Okay, I'm installing this free antivirus. Yes, 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 yes. Next, 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 next. Okay, you just opted in. Yeah. Bam, we have all your stuff. <sighs> and we're selling it to everyone. Mm -hmm. Why does this come as a surprise to people? No, it's not a surprise, Jeff. It's just proven. Mm -hmm. Free is never free. Well, exactly. I learned that as a kid. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes for free. Mm -hmm. If it's free, there's always something attached to it. Mm -hmm. Has Facebook not taught us anything? <laughs> they've taught us a lot, Jeff. Like, we've learned so much. You know what? You know what I've learned by Facebook? Mm. That people just still use it. Yep. <laughs> people yeah, just absolutely. still do it. Like, yep. Jeff, you're still on Facebook. Yeah. I, I am still on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a necessary evil. But yeah. no. I, I, I don't use Avast for this reason anytime i see a free virus software i go uh -uh. antivirus antivirus even. yeah like <laughs> i'm not touching it that's why i do use subscription-based services mm -hmm. because when you're putting money behind it there's a company that's going to actually stand behind their product as opposed to collecting your user data yeah but there's kaspersky and mcafee too sure well exactly yes but you could also get free versions of those <laughs> <laughs> okay all right but putting money at it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But it's right. much better than, hey, get this for free. Uh, it's like yeah, the, yeah, because yeah. you're paying for it somehow. Yeah. So, yeah, the I, free versions of these products are definitely going to have some some caveats to them for I, sure. I'm just wondering yeah. how long before we see some sort of uh, lawsuit. Yeah, I don't because know. Because the I interesting thing... In. You opted in. And, and opted it's in. a cop-out. Because, well, yeah, no, you no, said the yes opt-in was until 2000, was it 19? Yeah, but they've retroactively added it to the system. Right, but everybody's anything, just going to hit okay. Opted, okay. Okay, 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 okay. That, yeah. you know, okay. Like, I do. Oh, I got another pop-up. Okay. Yeah. I'm the guy that reads the fine print before I sign up for something. Yeah. You're, you're not you're, you're not the average user though, Jeff. I know I'm not the average yeah. user. That, I'm just the suspicious the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many people are doing this. So many people don't really realize what's happening. Yeah. And that Now you know though, folks. Now you know. 
Yeah. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. All right, do we have some names? Yes, we have names. All right. a ton of names. Names! Stick around. We're going to be doing our draw right after this. All right, we've got your ballots in, folks, and we've got your names written down. Congratulations to everyone who has qualified so far. I see. Who do I see? Skyrider64, Marshman GF, F King, Swessig, G-Dog 1985, Baldrick the Brave, Orange Man, Marshman, Ameridroid, BP9, Mini Marsh, RD Blair, Ronnie Cat. Tell me when I start repeating myself. And M. Copland. I feel like that was like proper room. I see it's I Billy. Feel, I see you too. <laughs> and I always feel like a kitten when I'm doing this. It's not toilet paper. <laughs> Are you ready? You guys ready? Yeah. So this is for, I'm actually getting steps right now, so this is great. This is really good. This is how I track my steps with my fitness tracker, which you are about to win. Let's see here, folks. Here we go. Here we go. Do we know where BP9 is watching from? I know they've mentioned it in the chat. Uh, BP9, Al, congratulations. Al backwards. Your fitness tracker. All you have to do is private message me your shipping address or send me an email live at category5.tv, and that will be shipped to you this week. Where's Al congratulations. Backwards? Hey, if you want to qualify for our next draw, all you have to do is email live at category5.tv. Tell us where you're watching from and what your username is, and you could be next to win whatever it is we happen to be giving away. Yes. Yes, thank you everybody for joining us this week. Congratulations once again to our winner, BP9. Do check out pine64.org with the new Pinebook Pro ANSI edition. And we will see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.